I pray if you're in here today, you're ready. I pray you're ready for his return. It is not a joke. <laughs> it's not a fairy tale. It's not a story that has been handed down that people just repeat like Hansel and Gretel or Little Red Riding Hood or Chicken Little. I'm here to tell you, sure enough, the sky is falling. And you need to be ready for his return. If you're here today and you know that you know that you know that you're ready, you ought to bless the Lord. You ought to praise the Lord. Amen. Brother Cody, I'm not going to wait till the end this morning back there in the office. Amen, Brother Cody bowed his head before a holy God and said, Lord, come into my heart. Praise God. I accept you as my Savior. And we have one more. Hell lost another one. Amen. Hell lost another one. Praise the name of the Lord. Most high God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And his mercy endureth forever. Amen. That's why we praise the Lord. Act like you have no sense in here. Amen. Praise God. If he did it for him, he can do it for you. Praise the Lord. God bless you, brother. Amen. He jumped up off that couch and hugged me and I hugged him. And the Spirit of the Lord was in the place, and He's here right now. You don't have to sit down. We're going to read the Testament, read the Scripture. Amen. Praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow. He's still in the saving business. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're at the end of Hebrews, and uh, I pray you're praying with me today and praying for me. Amen. The Lord has given me a word. And I certainly want to uh, be obedient to him and be obedient to the text. This is the end of the Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews that we have uh, gone through methodically. And the Lord, I pray, has blessed your heart. Amen. Amen. Hebrews, the 13th chapter. We won't get all of it today, but we're coming down towards the end. So we pray your uh, prayers over this sermon today that God speaks as he has never before speak, spoken to us here. He speaks clearly to us today. Chapter 13, verse 1 from the ESV version. It says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as those in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Amen. Amen. Thank God for his promises. Amen. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who speak to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have been uh, have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar for, from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. 
Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, let, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. We know God's word is already blessed in the ears of the hearers. Let us be not only hearers of the word, but doers as well. God, we thank you one more time for this opportunity to preach to these, your people, your sheep, those who are here today. We pray that you will bless those who are here maybe for the first time. We pray that you will bless those who are here, God, and that their ears are, will be open and attentive to your word that you are speaking. We pray for that sinner that is closest to hell. Arrest their attention even now, Lord, that one may be saved today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We thank you for all your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As you take your seat this afternoon, this morning, I pray that you will give me some attention and I will try my best to get through this text expeditiously, but let us be attentive to the word of God. Uh, there is something for all of us in here today, and if I were to give this sermon a title from this last, next to last sermon series of Hebrews, I would simply say it is called a spiritual study guide for the believer. A spiritual study guide for the believer. I was thinking over this text and praying over this text, and I can remember as a kid, I had, I got for Christmas a digital watch, and that's when, when you got stuff for Christmas, it meant something to you, and I got this little gold digital watch that mom had, had got me, and it had all the those digital looking numbers, you know how the 80s stuff looked, and uh, I got it for Christmas, and we got to where we had, you know, we, about a week later, you have watch night service. And I got to the to the date. And of course, we had watch night service at Tridstone, and they they literally watched the, the New Year in. They watched it in. We would meet there and have some food around ten, if I'm not mistaken. And then we would go on in there and, and be in service. And they'd have preaching on that night and and testimony. And then you'd be up for about ten till twelve, and they they'd start praying. And they'd be down praying at the altar, and I'm down looking at the watch because I wanted to watch. The new year tick in on my digital watch and uh, it was I, I still remember that 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 memory is firm in my mind and and the reason being because I knew that as I had listened as a child that every time the clock ticked amen every time the new year turned over every time we changed the calendar that that was a moment that we were closer to the return of Christ y'all say amen on that Y'all agree with me on that? Every tick of the clock today, we, we are one second, one minute, one hour, whatever it may be, closer to his return. I pray we'll all be ready. Amen. We, we didn't plan to sing that today, but it's working just fine with the message. I, I pray we'll all be ready because every second you are one breath closer to eternity. Even in a cartoons that I watch, and I'm an 80s, late 70s and 80s kid, even in the cartoons I watched, I remember one in particular talking about, and, and it was fictional obviously, but a, a calamity befalling the earth in 1994, and that asteroids were coming, and comets, and tsunamis, and, and earthquakes, and you know, I'm thinking 1994, even at that particular time in 1982, a phenomenon that had never happened. All of the planets lined up out from the sun in 1982. And I, I remember Mrs. Sandy Hunter talking about that on the playground. And that caught my attention. And I thought, is this the end? Are we, are we right here at the end? And, and 94 came and, and nothing happened. You know, it was a cartoon. But then we got to 1999. Y'all remember 1999? Folks that said they was going to party like it was, it was 1999. 1999 came and, 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 and Y2K, y'all remember that, came. And I know my family remembers and my wife and I especially remember because 
We were out there at a, a New Year's party with our with her mother and family, and 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 her her papa's the chair broke while he was leaning back in it. Sound like a gun going off. Everybody screamed and hollered, and it just happened right around the time when the New Year was changing. That party closed down real fast. Y2K, 2000, and, and then 9-11 happened, and everybody was like, is this it? Is this it? I remember sitting watching the towers and the repeat of it happening on television and, and thinking, and everybody just wanted everything to get back to normal. And then everybody got to talking about the, the Mayan calendar, December 21st, 2012, and, and calamity. They even put a movie out about it. That came and went. And, and then the pandemic happened in 2020. And here we are in 2023, and I'm sure there are people saying they've been saying the end is coming forever, yet nothing's happened. Can I ask you a question? How does it feel to be here in 2023 in the condition of the world? Will we say in 10 years from now, boy, that was just another phase, or will we be in glory looking back and saying, I'm glad I was ready when he came? I went through all those dates to tell you this and remind you one more time. I don't set dates, but I'm here to tell you he is closer to his return than he was in 82, than he was in 94, than he was in 99, 2000, 2001, 2012, 2020, and even right now. Before I could end this sermon, this church could be I pray you wouldn't be the last one in here looking around saying, where did they go? I don't know, but as I consider this two-minute warning that we're in, it makes me feel even more. I've been torn in my spirit. Now I understand, Lord. I hear you. I've been torn in my spirit. Yes, I'm ready to go to heaven. Yes, I am. But there's also some folks here that I know I still have to say something to. Yeah. 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 Uh, we got a responsibility to be serious in our, I'm going to use one of these old folks word, in our deportment for Christ. <laughs> I hear my mom saying that in Sunday school, deportment. I'm thinking, we transferring folks out of here? No, look at the definition Deportment meaning a person's behavior and their manners towards somebody. I, I, I got to have the right behavior because I have the right savior in my life. I got to treat people right. I have the right manners. I got to do what the Bible says to do. So as we begin to think about this text, the Lord said on my mind on a verse to start this out with Colossians 3, 16. Y'all still praying with me? And, and, and it says... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We are to encourage one another in the Lord with his word. Amen. So as we look at this text today, in this final chapter of Hebrews, the writer, which many believe to be Paul, he encourages those believers of that time, and he encourages us today. He gives us some practical admonitions. Now, I can't speak for you, but it is greatly important that you understand God's word is not read in church just that you might be a hearer of the word, but that you might also be a doer of the word. My friends and my sisters and brothers, there has to be an application for the word of God. You've got to apply it to your life. Application is key for scripture. Well, what I'm trying to say to you, let me say it a different way, is reading it without living it gives no profit. It doesn't do you any good. Reading it without living it doesn't do anything for you. In fact, you have to learn to take God's word and put your spiritual boots to the ground and allow God's word to live through you as you live. If you look at the text and look back at the history of this book, you, you will find that there were, as is today, 
enemies of the early church of that day that were saying, now Hebrews, if you remain true to Christ, you will lose friends, you will lose materials, you, you will lose your goods, you will lose religion, you will lose your heritage. If you remain true to Christ, you're going to lose a lot. How many of you in here know you can testify now? If you can look back and say to those folks then, you know what? If you lose all those things, so be it. If you gain Christ, you got everything anyway. Anybody in here with me? So Paul is saying, he's saying here, the writer is saying, turn your back on the age old material, religious, worldly system. That's what he's saying to them. And whatever form it takes, at that day it was Judaism, but nowadays it's, it's everything. It's, it's smorgasbordism. Yeah. I know that ain't a word, but it is now. <laughs> well, 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 preacher, what, what, what's smorgasbordism? It's where you take a little bit of this and, and a little bit of that and a, and a little bit of this and, and a little bit of this teaching over here and a little bit of this preacher here. Can I pause and tell you, you can't listen to everybody that's on TikTok. Amen. And I'm not saying that to make you listen to me more, but I'm here to tell you everything that's online, you better watch out for. You, you can't listen. There's, there's a little bit of everything out there, and a lot of people are, are doing like old school smorgasbord, go past the, the, the Duff's line, and I'm tasting a little bit of everything. Make sure my plate's covered. Amen. Amen. Today, we live in a, an age where people say, be true to yourself. Be true to thine own self and believe in your own truth. Make your own truth. And, and the Bible, it's not truth. It, it's not that necessary. It, you, you can make up your own truth. And if you live according to how you believe, you'll be okay. Can I ask you one more time? The scripture clearly tell us what profit a man to gain the whole world, get everything, and then lose his soul because he didn't believe in the right truth. So I thought about this text, and then we'll hurry through. Look at this. When you went to school, y'all know I'm a school teacher, right? <laughs> Somebody says, oh, Lord. <laughs> well, we're in school. We're at the end of the quarter with our school. And we're about a week out. And, and since I'm a teacher, you know, you get to the end and there's some things. You, you have a unit test or a final test. If you're in college, you take final exams and, and things like that. And I wasn't always a teacher. I, I was a student as well. And, and I remember the teachers handing out those study guides and saying, now this is everything you need to know. They didn't have to do that, by the way. But they did, and they do, and say, now this is what will be on the test. Now you let me give a test in Wednesday night Bible study. We'll have some folks. I won't say any names because I love her. She's like my second mama. But, my shit. but uh, <laughs> they'll be asking for a study guide. <laughs> bless you, bless you. Amen. If you look at this, yeah, cheat cheated. If you look at this, it's really like Paul gives these people a study guide. And he's saying these are some things, this, this educational application here. Is, is when you get to the big chapter test, and how many of you know life is a test? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is what you need to keep in mind as you go through the test. Mm -hmm. Wow. As you wrap things up and as we come to the end of this book, the writer said, I have some final statements, a, a checkoff list, if you will. And as you go through this checkoff list, now keep in mind, praise the Lord, the headmaster, amen, the one over the school, praise the name of the Lord, Hebrews 12, 29. Keep in mind as you go through this, it, it, what does it say about the headmaster? It says, our God, he, he's a terrible God. He's an awesome God. Y'all see that in the text, Hebrews 12, 29? He's a consuming so with that in mind, here are some truths that would be on the study guide. He, he's saying we need to check these things off and make sure we put them to memory. There should be, here it is, Paint Creek, there should be no cloudy areas as to how we're living. should be no cloudy areas in what God expects us to know. There should be no cloudy areas in what God 
is saying to the church, the living church of God. First thing he's saying, verses 1 through 4, look at the text. He is saying love is in order. Amen. Amen. Love is in order. We, we need to have love in the fellowship. Y'all see that? Amen. And he gives different examples of why love is important. He first says, love your brothers in Christ. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? That's pretty self-explanatory. He is saying you are to love those who are in Christ. Now, I thought about this, and I'm going to make it very simple. I'm not trying to be technical and, and all these high words and things today. I just want to bring it right straight down the middle. Living in a world that hates those who love Jesus, you would think that the most important place we could show love is right here in the church. Amen. You would think that. Here's what I found out in 50 years. I'm going to come on down the road. Sometimes the church can be a hate fest. I know I wouldn't get a whole lot on that. I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking about what I have experienced. Sometimes we forget that this is supposed to be ground zero for love. Greater love have no man that he laid down his life for his friend. Jesus loved us with a love we can't even comprehend. And we're supposed to be ambassadors of his love. But sometimes hate sneaks in. Yeah. And the church can be not ground zero for love, but for hate. Yeah. Far be it from this church or any church for folks to go out of here and say, them folks are crazy up there. They are crazy. They're going at this one saying this one and this one's over here mad at this one and this one's over here in the corner talking about that one in that corner. That should never be. This should be a place of love for the brother. So that when a sinner does come in here, they are convicted by the overwhelming power of God's love in this place. You want to know why the enemy wants you to hate somebody? Because that jams the signal of God's love for somebody else. So why does love suffer? Why, what, 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 what comes of that? Why are we lacking sometimes in the church? And, and Paul, I know some don't believe he's a writer, but I do. Paul addresses this. He, he, he says sometimes, and he dealt with, with the other letters, he, he said sometimes egos get in the way. And sometimes agendas and sometimes it's even just simple lack of teaching. Amen. You need to be under spirit led Bible teaching. Amen. And sometimes it's lack of teaching. People come up in a climate of not loving. And so therefore that brings it into their personal life. And God has to literally reprogram you into loving one another so that you can show his love to others. Amen. Amen. You can't tell somebody about something you haven't experienced for yourself. Sometimes it's just simple selfishness. If I don't get anything out of it, then I'm not putting anything back in it. I know I'm right about it. Sometimes it's just simple vindication or even that ancient sin of pride. I know I'm wrong, but I'm not going to let anybody know because I've got a reputation to Protect. Let me tell you, what does the scripture say? The scripture says, look at it. Y'all see it in your first verse. Let brotherly love continue. That means even when he wrote it, it was supposed to continue and it's continuing even now. The writer also points out some areas where love has to flourish, where we are supposed to do this. He says, first of all, between brothers and sisters in the church let it continue and then he says even let your love pour out on those who you are maybe even not familiar with those who you don't know those of you who maybe you know people you don't particularly know it says sometimes that when you just simply are kind to a person you never know Christian when you have entertained an angel unaware amen, amen. amen. I'm reminded of Abraham Guys came and he perceived right away they weren't regular guys. They showed up at his tent door and the Bible says he went and made a meal for him. 
Bible says he went and made them comfortable and, and they, they met that they're on the plains of memory and they were angels and he attended to them and he was, he was aware. But sometimes people that cross your path, you may not know who they are, why God sent them across your path. Whatever you do, show them love. Amen. Share the love of the Lord with them. It says even, even to the point that the stranger may feel the love of the Lord through your life. I, I know we live in a day and age where people talk about stranger danger and all these things, but I still, it's just me, the way I was brought up, I still try to speak to somebody that I pass on the street, even if they don't speak back, because you never know when just that simple conversation might open up a door for you to say something to them about the Savior that has saved you. Amen. Be ready to show love. Don't view people like nu nuisances or, or, a, or but view them rather as assignments. He even says, look at this, not only should you show the stranger love and show love in the church, but those who are in prison, amen? Those literally, as he meant here, those who were imprisoned for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, because that could be you. He also says to show those who are behind bars love by ministering to them, seeing about them. Do you remember what Jesus said? That we should feed the hungry. We should clothe the naked. We should visit those who are in prison. Those who are incarcerated. That's how the church shows the great love of God. Not just in word only. But in deed as well. I'm reminded of what the Bible says about our Savior. That Jesus looked at the masses of people with compassion. As sheep that had no shepherd. He looked upon them. And even they, though they were flawed and, and ugly in their sin and all that we have. We, we got baggage, don't we? He, he, he saw them as sheep with no shepherd. And it caused him to have compassion for them. Look at the text. He says even, this is a good point, Christian church. He, he says you need to show love and it's first modeled at home in your marriage. Amen. Uh-oh. Amen. Yeah, yeah, that's in the text. Y'all read it, don't you? <laughs> Y'all follow along. Is that in there? Is that in there? Well, yeah, love is, the, is, is a picture in the marriage, and marriage, I'm sorry, is a rather, is a picture of Christ and his church. So when we fail to love correctly in our marriage, then we, uh, literally, you could say it this way, we can do harm to the gospel. We can do harm to the thing that the Lord has shown us. How do you, how do you mean that, Pastor? Well, Jesus is the bridegroom, and the church, that's us, is the bride of Christ. So that shows us what a picture of marriage is. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, points that out. But what works against the marriage, Pastor? It's in the text. Sexual sin, immorality, and any perversions of marriage. The church, if we don't get anything else right, we've got to get marriage right. Amen? And we've got to understand that marriage always points to a picture of Christ who gave himself for his bride, the church. Today, the attack on marriage, make no mistake about it, is attack on the gospel. It is an attack on the church. If you look and understand what marriage is, and, and it's in the text, read between the lines, marriage is about faithfulness. Can I ask you one question in here this afternoon? Has God been faithful to you? Yes. Even when you weren't faithful to him, he's been faithful to you. So marriage is about forgiveness and marriage is about grace and marriage is about love and marriage points to the fact that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the bridegroom, Jesus the Christ. Bride of Christ, again, are you glad that God loved you enough to give you the right bridegroom? Are you glad you said yes to the dress? Some of y'all will get that on the way home. <laughs> Let's move on down the study guide. Y'all still praying with me? Not only do we have to get love right and we got to understand what love is, but here it is. And don't miss this. You, you better get assurance right. Yeah. You got to have some assurance today. People are losing ground today and their doubt. And you got to be perfectly assured. Look at verses five and six. The Christian must be assured of what he has. What she has. Assurance is under fire 
in the Christian church today. People are in doubt because the word of God is not being rightly divided. They have gotten into this point where they think there is something they have to add to their salvation to make it work. And so therefore, when they can't add it, when they fall short in getting it done right, or so they think, then they are not assured in their salvation. Can I tell you something here today? There is nothing you can do to be saved except call on the name of the Lord. Jesus did it all. But there's also nothing you can do to lose your salvation. If it were to that point, then Jesus would have lied when he said they will not perish. I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will not lose a one. Never, no, never. So something's got to give. If you're saved, amen, then he saved you by his grace and his mercy. And then he's able, come on, Brother Dotson, he's able to keep you by his grace. Oh, to be kept by who? Christian, I ain't keeping you. Oh, to be kept by Richard? He can't keep you. Oh, to be kept by Darlene, she can't keep you. Oh, to be kept by Jesus. Somebody say, he's keeping me. He's keeping me. So, 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 so false doctrines have taken their toll on many a believer. That's why I preface this by saying you can't listen to everybody that sounds like they sound good. Amen. They'll tell you all kind of things. You got to do this to stay saved. You got to do that to be saved. You, you got to play on the drums and you got to show up for choir time to be saved. You got to put so much money in to be saved. I'm here to tell you one more time. There's nothing you can do except place your faith in a holy God who sent his only son to die for your sin. Amen. He keeps you saved. Our salvation is a miracle, and it is certainly brought about by an omnipotent, wrought by an omnipotent God. He's able to save us. He's able to keep us to the point that the writer points out again that it's not money that can keep you. Somebody knows that's right. <laughs> Amen. We, we live in a day, come on, you, you had a PIN number that you couldn't even remember your PIN number. <laughs> Amen. I, I had some had money and then the fraud alert came up and somebody took money out of my account. Fraudulent and identity theft. Financial stability. How many of you know money is fleeting just as quick as it comes in your pocket? I don't even get it in my pocket anymore. We got direct deposit now. As soon as quick as it hits the bank. So I can tell you, if you don't believe me, I'm a witness. Money won't save you. I don't care how much of you have or how much you don't have. Hear here, here, here what, what the Apostle Paul also says later to the Philippians. He said, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to be low. I know how to abound. I know how to be high and everywhere in between and all the things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. But here's what he said I found. I found that in Christ, I have everything I need. I think that's where he wants the church today, fully depending on him. We don't depend on money. We don't depend on our good looks. Those change too. Come on, y'all. Some of y'all who passed by the mirror this morning and, and said, I, ugh, I, don't, I don't look as good as I used to. Yeah. Jesus said, Jesus said, I'm taking him to the bank on it. No pun intended. I will never leave you, no forsake you. And that counts to when I don't have any money. That counts to when I don't look good anymore. That counts to when I don't have the friends I used to have. He said, I will come literally along and walk right beside you. I'll stick closer than a brother. So the Lord is my helper. Y'all see that in the text? 
I will not fear what man can do to me because I've got the greatest one ever. He's in my corner. He's my cut man. Amen. He's my, my guy that, that cleans me up. He, he gives me water when I'm thirsty. Amen. He, he massages my spiritual muscles. He anointed my head with oil. And my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever. Somebody's praying for me in here today. Praise the name of the Lord. So, therefore, I have blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. Glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation purchased by, by God. Praise the name of the Lord. Are y'all in here? Do you have blessed assurance? So, we got to get that right. We've got to love right. We've got to be assured that what Scripture says we have, we have it. Yeah. Yes. Got to stand right. We've got to come to the point simply that simply says, I am more afraid of God than I am of man. Yeah. Amen. Let's keep moving down this study, God. There will be no test that I'm giving you on paper, but I'm here to tell you that there's a test in life coming. Yeah. Next up is a simple word, love, assurance. Don't miss this one, respect. Mm. Yeah. Now, the world views respect a little bit different, but in verses 7 through 10, I believe that it is showing us that there is respect, first of all, for God's word. Let me ask you questions, and I interact with you frequently. I, I like for you to talk back to me. Do you respect God's word like you should? Do you hold it as the end all, as the thing that you go to first? God's word is to be held in highest of regard, and it should start with the church. God's word is, and I wrote it down this way, God's word is the great end all. What do you mean by that, preacher? It ends all debates. There is no debate. In fact, we shouldn't have to form, help me, Holy Ghost, a committee to decide if God's word is what God's word said it was. You either believe it or you don't. You either receive it or you don't. We shouldn't have to debate. It said it, and that's the end of it. So here it is. We, we, we are a theocracy in this church. We are governed by God's word, not man's laws, not man's wishes, not man's agenda. And here's why it backs it up. Because I fear God more than I fear man. I'm not going to have to stand man stand before man at the end of time. I will be standing before a holy God. No court will hold me. I, I may go to one before I leave this earth. I don't know. But one of these days, the last court will be convened in heaven. And I will stand before God. You'll stand one of two ways. Either with a counsel in your, in your corner, in your behalf, an advocate whose name is Jesus. Or you'll stand by yourself. Amen. 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 So let, let's, let's not miss this. Many, a well-meaning church has run afoul and gotten off track because they fail to keep God's word in the proper perspective. They took man's words instead of God's words. If you, if you notice here, respect shows us that there is an order, there is a progression. God's word is at the top. Amen? Because God is at the top. Then the pastor who God gives the words of life to deliver, he delivers. That's my job. My job is to get the mail from God and to put it in your lap. Then it's on you after that. Amen. The shepherd feeds the sheep. Amen. Amen. And I can take you to the pastor and I can show you where the grass is and I can put it in front of you, but you've got to eat it. Amen. Amen. The church then acts or doesn't act. On God's word. That's the part where it gets quiet. Either you believe it or you don't. And everybody in here, we've been in that. Ah, Pastor, I know. That. And the previous one and the one before that. Yes, some things he said, yeah, they were right. But then I got my own view. I'm telling you again, it's on you to whether you believe what God has said 
or not? Do you line up with God's word? Do you line up with what he has prescribed? And, and then the, 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 the next progression is either you are happy for having lined up with God's word or you're unhappy for not having lined up. Amen. Respect. Respect for God's word. Respect for the leaders. Look at what the text says. Respect for them that rule over you. Pastors are God's gift to the church and they are to feed the flock. So get this, what Paul is saying here in Hebrews, more than likely these leaders had now passed off the scene and he just simply said, remember what they told you. You ever pause sometimes and think about prior sermons? Things that were preached and a sermon that sticks in the back of your mind. I, I still remember this gentleman has been gone a long time. But I remember as a kid, Reverend Bowen in, in Portsmouth, and he preached about snake church folk. I, I'll never forget that sermon. Lord have mercy. He preached about the worm. I, I remember uh, Reverend Freeman preaching about poison in the pot. And praise God, I remember Reverend Douglas Clayton Carter preaching about a sin-sick world. I'm here to tell you, sermons and God's word make the difference in your life. Do you remember the day you heard the gospel for the first time and what the Lord said to you and how it affected Affected your life. If you can remember that, praise the name of the Lord right here and right now because God's word still has an effect on you. Amen. Don't ever get to the point that you can sit under preaching and it just bounce off you like water off a duck's back. That's dangerous territory. Paul is saying, remember the words of the Lord. So what were they doing? They were preaching Jesus. They got it right. Amen. They got it right. They were preaching Jesus and him crucified. They were preaching Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I can still hear Sister Virginia Garn say those words. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So Jesus has not changed. So therefore, get this, the message doesn't change. So... They are also preaching respect and, and, and showing this by imitation. Notice this. He, he is saying in the text, do as you have learned and you have seen. Don't be led away by perverse teaching. And so apparently there were some in the church or around the church that were preaching that keeping the Old Testament and ceremonial laws and rituals and, and having certain foods and, and putting them out and, and that was important to your salvation. Do you understand that message has not changed? People, again, are still preaching today saying you've got to accept the Lord as your Savior and then add a little pinch of this and a little pinch of that. You've got to make it your recipe. One more time, church, the recipe has not changed because Jesus has not changed. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I saw that personally in my office this morning. The, the recipe has not changed. It still works. Amen. Amen. So how do we know this comes to fruition? Because when this happens, the Holy Spirit indwells the new believers and then they are changed from the inside out. Have you noticed a change in you since you were saved? Can you look at that and say, you know what? I'm not what I used to be. There's been a great change in me. Don't go to sleep on me. Stick with me. Amen. And there's been a change that has happened and it's continuing to happen. I don't act like I used to. I used to snap back at folks. Now I just turn and I begin praying for them. Amen. Don't you know the Lord will make a change on the inside? So this key concept has not changed in the church in over 2,000 years. Jesus said it. Men believed it. They preached it. They proclaimed it. People were saved. They began to share the gospel. They preached it. They proclaimed it. And it has passed down until now. And if it ain't broke, y'all believe it? 
I'm about finished, but Jesus has not changed. So why are we trying to change his message? What, why are we trying to make it more palatable for the masses of people so that we may fill the pews? And we, we got to, Pastor, you got to say it this way. You got to do this. You, we've got to have this. I'm here to tell you one more time. We can have programs, that's fine. We can have agendas, that's fine. But if it's not centered around the message of the cross, Jesus Christ and him crucified, then we have missed the mark. Verses 11 through 16 then simply gives us one final word that should be on your study guide. Y'all got it? Go ahead and say it to me. What was the first word? Thank you. What was the second word? What's the third word? And the last word is sacrifice. That's a word we must not forget, church. We must not forget this important concept. Because of sin, and because sin is everywhere in the world, and because men are born into sin, there had to be a great sacrifice. Jesus is that sacrifice. In fact, the Hebrew converts in turning to Christ, they were told, you'll lose the temple, you'll lose the sacrifices, you'll lose the, the priesthood, you, you will lose all these things. And then the writer here says, but you'll gain so much more. I'm glad I'm not under the Old Testament sacrificial system. I, I don't like to see blood like that. Anybody else? I don't like to see little animals have that happen. I, that's a rough thing. I, I'm glad that there was a Lamb of God that took upon him the sins of the world. Amen. So as we wrap up this book, remember what the writer was saying from the beginning. Here it is. Christ is superior. Y'all remember that text? Y'all remember that Christ is superior. Christ is better. Christ is better than the Old Testament prophets. Christ is better than the angels. Christ is better than the Old Testament sacrifice. Christ is better than the Old Testament high priest. Christ is the great high priest. He is my supreme advocate. He is the only advocate for mankind. Christ has given us a new covenant in his blood. So in the Gospels, Christ literally rejected the temple and he those in it and called it a den of thieves. Y'all remember that? He, he went into the synagogue and, and I won't act it out, but he turned over the money changers tables and he called it a cesspool. He said, you made my father's house into a den of thieves rather than a house of prayer. He cleaned it out. He, he overturned those things. That was physical. But understand this. He is still doing that today, but on a far greater level. What do you mean, preacher? He, he's not overturning money tables in the church, but he is overturning hearts. Yes. Praise God. He, he is flipping mindsets. He, he is turning hearts towards him. He is changing lives. So as you look at the text, verses 11 through 16, you will notice that in the Old Testament, there had to be an altar. Praise God. That altar in the New Testament is the cross on Calvary's hill. In, in the Old Testament, there had to be a day of atonement. Somebody in here knows what I'm talking about. But in the New Testament, that day of atonement was on a Friday. Amen. Amen. The day that Jesus died. The, the, the Old Testament economy had an animal that had to be taken outside the camp and slaughtered in behalf of the sins of the people. But in the New Testament, they marched Jesus outside of the walls of Jerusalem, outside the city, if you will, outside of the camp. And there on a hill called the place of the skull, Golgotha, Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundations of the world, gave up his life. Y'all believe the text? It said that he, in verse 12, follow along with me, he suffered outside the gate. I'm so glad he suffered. Amen. Why did he suffer? So that you and I could be sanctified. I'm preaching. Amen. Why did he suffer? So that you and I could be cleansed. Preach, Pastor Scott. Why did he suffer? Because you and I needed a Savior. They marched him outside 
of the city of Jerusalem to that place where people, thieves, went to die. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Pastor Scott, what do you see as you go down the streets of Jerusalem in this particular? Can your minds I view this? Yes, I can. I see drops of his blood lining the streets as he went. He shed his blood. I, what do you see on Calvary, Pastor Scott? I, I see his blood running down to cleanse the multitude of my sins, which were many. Notice I said were. What happened to him, preacher? He washed them all away. They crucified him. Look at the text outside of Jerusalem, signifying that it wasn't just a Jewish thing. Come on, Bible study, folks. But that he was opening the door for Gentiles like you and I. Salvation is of the Jews, but I'm glad that when he opened his arms up wide, he welcomed me into the fold. So as I close, have you, have you been to the foot of the cross? That's what he's saying. Have you been to the outside of of the camp. There, there's a need for that today. Amen. Watch this. Watch this. We need to go outside of religious activity, outside of routine, and simply camp out at the cross. At the cross where I first saw the light. You may, my friends and sisters and brothers, you may end up in disgrace at times. You may take on some shame for your faith as, as the writer reminds these Hebrews, but it is worth it. How many of you know it's worth it in here today to go outside of the camp, to be with Christ and to say, I choose you instead of what everybody else is doing. I choose you instead of what everything else is saying that I need to do. I choose you. I am loyal to you and because I know that only what I do for Christ will last. Say, I choose loyalty. Yes. My Savior is not of this world. Right. Look at the text, verse 14. I, I don't look for a city made by him here, but I look for what is to come. Yes. We don't have time, church, to be attached to this world. Amen. So the writer is saying, don't store up your treasure here for where your treasure is, your heart is also. Told you about my peculiar prayer, Lord, but let me come less attached to the things of the world the closer you get because I know that this is not where it ends. I have a city that is prepared by you in the heavenlies that's prepared for me. There's a mansion for me somewhere in glory. The writer says you can't go on any longer with this synagogue sacrifice. You have to put it out there, Jews. You have to offer up God your praise. So I'm going to throw the ball to your court now, Pink Creek. Look at the last line of the text. It says, we no longer take lambs and, and we no longer take animals, the blood of bulls and goats. That's what Hebrew said. But we offer him the fruit of our lips. I think we got to work on that a little bit. It says, we offer him the fruit of our lips. What does that mean? We no longer bring a literal animal sacrifice in here. We bring our praise. We bring our worship. Yes. And it is a sacrifice. I get it sometimes to go from this setting right here to here. Yes. It's a sacrifice. I get it. Sometimes it's a sacrifice to go from here to here. Yes. I realize that sometimes it's a sacrifice to go from here to here. Sometimes it's a sacrifice, I get it, to go from being quiet to, Lord, I love you. Lord, I praise you. And I don't care what anybody else does, but right now I'm getting mine because I love you. You first loved me. I don't deserve your goodness, but right here and right now, I praise you. Why do you praise him, Christian? Because I once was lost, but now I'm Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. We offer up the fruit of our lips for our great Savior, our sacrifice, the one who went outside of the camp and gave 
his very life for us. Amen. I don't deserve his goodness, but I'm glad he poured it out on a wretch of a sinner like me. He died. He suffered. He bled. He died. He was buried. He rose again early on the third day. He got up with all power in his hands. Power to save me. Power to deliver me. Power to keep me saved. I will, I will, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name. Together I sought the Lord and he heard me. He delivered this poor man. I will, in spite of my circumstances, I will, in spite of the situation, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He has done, he has done great things for me. He has given me what I don't deserve. He has done for me what I could never do for myself. He has loved me with an everlasting love. I don't deserve it, but I praise him right now. I'm gonna offer him the fruit of my lips. I'm asking you, what about you, church? This may be your last opportunity, but I will praise God for all he's done. As you stand to your feet, when I come into your presence, I lift up both my hands. I humble myself. Yeah. Why? For all you've done for me. Yes. You've redeemed me and set me free. And I'm going to praise you, not because of who I am, but just because he's God. Hallelujah. He's God. Hallelujah. He's, he's God. He's God. How God is he? He's God uh, from the rising of the sun until the going down uh, of the same. I'm trying to close, but it's like fire. Shut up in my bones. I, I've got to praise him. I, I've got to give him glory. Mm, he's done too much for me to be quiet. He's not a quiet savior when you get to heaven and when you see him as he is, you won't stand there. You will praise him. You will give him glory. You will fall at his feet and worship him. Give him the fruit of your lips right now. If you don't, the rocks will cry out. If you don't, the rocks will cry out. If you don't, the rocks will cry out. Ain't no rock going to cry out for me. Lord, I love you. Lord, I bless your name in this place. God, we thank you. Even now, you are blessing us with air to breathe. A mind to think. A mouth to talk. Legs to stand on this morning. Lord, we thank you. Arms to wave. And Lord, if we can wave our arms for a football game. And we can run our mouth for a basketball game. Yes. And we can stand up and move our heads and our lips, Lord, for sports. Surely, surely, surely we can stand and magnify your name. Make you larger in this place today. Lord, you stood between the heavens and the earth. And you were on that cross for my sins. Lord, from the sixth to the ninth hour, you died. And I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, Lord, I can't thank you enough. Lord, I thank you, I go to my grave thanking you, Lord, because you've done so much for me. Now, I pray that it will pour out on the rest of those who are here, those who are to come, those who you will move into this position, these places of position of ministry, Lord, that we will have a fire at this church, Lord, that is not put out, but when people come in, they will feel the power of your presence. Thank you, God. We are in love with you because you first loved us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Bless now, Lord, and I thank you for the victory of today. Yes. Let that sinner now who is closest to hell come, run, cry out. Yes. I yield 
what must I do to be saved? Thank you, Lord. You are a consuming fire. You are terrible and awesome, God, but you also love us. Bless now these your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Doors of the church are open. Over 2,000 years, I've already told you Christ died that we might live. There is none like him. Have you surrendered to the Savior? Have you seen the cross? There still is room for one. Amen. He loves you. And he loves you enough to give you his best. The least you can do is offer yourself up as well. When we surrender to the Lord, we are saying, Lord, I give you everything I have, good, bad, ugly, in the middle, everything in between. And I'm asking you to make of it what you will. God is a God that can take your messes and turn it into a message. Somebody in here knows what I'm talking about. I know the time is long, but I'm, I, I'm listening to the Lord and what he's saying. God can take your mess and turn it into a message. Amen. He has never lost a battle. And not one person he has called to him says, I regret coming. So now's your time, if there's one. If there's one.